On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, why are there no ships heading to the United States? I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. So it's not exactly no ships. It's why are there no container ships? And it's not just container ships, but a specific type of container ship. And these are the big, ultra-large container vessels. These are the ships over 16,000 TEU 20-foot equivalent unit. None of them are heading to and from the United States. And it raises the question, why? There was just a hearing in the U.S. House, the House Subcommittee on Transportation and Infrastructure, on the Red Sea and the Houthi attack, where the issue of infrastructure came up quite a lot. Now, not surprising, it is a committee on transportation and infrastructure. However, they were talking about the Red Sea. And why would infrastructure be such a key issue? If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, we're going to take a look. This is marine traffic. And I cleaned it up, so these are just container ships. So here you see all the world's container ships sailing around. And obviously there are a lot of them, and you can see them coming around. A lot of them leaving from Asia, heading across on the North Pacific route, heading up all the way up north through the Aleutians. That's that great circle route. It's actually, if you look at the world as a globe, not as a flat map, that makes the world a sense. Other ships heading across, avoiding the weather. You can see that big line of ships coming out of the Straits of Malacca heading down towards South Africa, some paralleling up along the eastern coast, heading up into the Indian Ocean. There's a few in and around the Red Sea, a huge line of them coming from South Africa, heading up to Europe. You'll see container ships crossing the Atlantic between Europe and the United States, and then the big cluster heading down here to the Panama Canal and up along the west coast of the United States. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the features here at Marine Traffic and we're gonna weed out those container ships that have less than 16,000 TEU. And when you do that, something really interesting happens. Now these are the big ultra large container vessels. And what you see is those ultra large container vessels operate from East Asia through Singapore. They head out through the Malacca Straits. They're heading over here to Sri Lanka to the terminal at Colombo. Now normally they would be heading across here to the Gulf of Aden, through the Bab El Mandab, everybody drink, up the Red Sea and out into the Mediterranean, but because of the Houthi, that has changed. Now you got a few up here in the Persian Gulf, a couple here in the uh, Red Sea. Some of them are going into Saudi Arabian ports. Some of them are from CMA, CGM, trying to run the blockade past the Houthi. But the vast majority of them are heading here around South Africa and then looping up coming into the terminals at Algeciras in, in Spain or down to here at Tangier in northern Morocco. Some going into the Mediterranean, heading up to Genoa and up to the, the boot here of Italy to Malta, over to Piraeus or over to Istanbul, or some heading up into northern Europe to Felixstowe, the London Gateway, Antwerp, Rotterdam, Bremerhaven, uh, Gdansk. But notice there are none over here in the United States, none on the East Coast, none on the West Coast. And that is pretty significant in my opinion. So this chart by Liner Lytica shows you the diversions of Asia to Europe services and how they broke down. This is as of last month in January. And so here you see the Far East to Northern Europe and in the, in the three big shipping alliances, the 2M, that's Maersk and Mediterranean shipping, the Ocean Alliance, that is uh, Costco, Evergreen, and uh, CMA, CGM, and then the Alliance, that's kind of everybody else. And you'll see here the average ship, ship size is pretty significant. I mean, when you start looking at average ship sizes here, 2M is running ships, you know, between 19, uh, 17 to 24,000. On the Swan line, it's the smallest with about 12,700 ships, uh, TU, excuse me. And then same thing here for the Ocean Alliance, the Alliance, I mean, these are all pretty large, significant vessels that are operating between these ports. And what has happened is the development of container ships has gotten extremely big. When you look at how container ships have developed, and this comes from John Paul Rodrigue's uh, fantastic site on transport geography, he has a site on the evolution of container ships. You'll see how container ships evolved from the early ones in the 50s all the way up into the 70s till you got here to kind of what he calls the B category. These are the Panama ships. These are the ships that were confined by the dimensions of the locks of the Panama Canal that were built back in 1914. And then in the late 80s, uh, you saw the idea that we're going to build ships bigger than the Panama Canal. And these were what became known as post Panamax. 
they're too big to go through the Panama Canal. And you saw TEUs jump from about three to 4,000. Now you're going from four to 8,000. And these are big ships. And understand, it's not a measure of just lengthening the ship and making it wider. But when you do this, the ship's containers, and this is the kind of the container storage here, it gets higher and wider for the ship. So you need special ship to shore cranes that are tall enough and can reach out that far. Plus, as these ships get bigger, they get deeper in the water. These figures here are in meters. And you see ships go from 12.5 meters, roughly around 36 foot draft, and now you're jumping to 13 meters to 14 and a half meters. So now you're talking almost about a 40 foot draft. And so as the ships got bigger, you needed the, the cranes to do it. And as you bring a ship in with more containers, you need a bigger laydown area, a yard, you need more uh, warehousing and facilities, you need better gates so you can move trucks and trains through faster. And as ships got bigger, this is a big thing. And then in the early 2000s, this is where things went off the rails. So early in the 2000s, you have the introduction of what are called the VLCSs, the Very Large Container Ships. These are ships up between 11,000 and 15,000 TEU. Maersk introduces the E-Class, and then eventually the Triple E-Class. And this kind of throws everything out the window. 397 meters, you're talking about over 1,200 feet in length. These are monster ships, 22 bays across, 10 containers high above the main deck. These are big. These can only go into certain terminals around the world. Now, by this point, by the mid-2000s, Panama had started building its new canal, its new system of locks. And when you built the new locks, then you had new parameters in place. So when you look at canals, the canals were the things that were the big constrainers. So the Suez, for example, constrained ships. Suez decided to expand. And so the Suez Canal by 2015 has grown to a size where it can accommodate ships. Panama has the same thing. They add a new series of locks. The new locks are much larger than the previous locks. And what that means is now your sh ship sizes can go up. So now you see the new dimensions come in. So in 2014, you see the introduction of what's called the Neo Panamax. So this ship is a much larger size than previously. You're talking about a ship 366 meters. Now it's, it's smaller than the VLCS, but that's because it's designed to fit into the Panama Canal. And Neo Panamax is really key because with that type of ship now, you can swing through the Panama Canal. And what we've seen is ships, this has 12,500 TEUs, but it actually goes up to about 15,000 TEUs. So you can get about a 15,000 TEU ship in. But then in the mid 2010s, you see the introduction of the ultra large container ship, Maersk with the Triple E, the first 18,000 box ship. But now what we're seeing are these behemoths, these 20,000, 21, 22, up to 24, thousand box ships the the mega box uh, 24s come in they have 24 containers across 13 high 400 meters in length uh, 61 meters wide 16 foot in depth it, it's incredible almost 50 feet they're drawing in water and when you have monsters that big you need ports that accommodate them so you need to dredge your ports you need to raise bridges because sometimes these things are so high they can't get under bridges. You need these new cranes. You need a huge laydown area. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see in the United States these, the ultra large container ships and the mega 24s coming in. Why is this important today? Well, it really wasn't that important until December when the Houthi made their appearance. Because what you had was container ships coming across from Malaysia, uh, from the Straits of Malacca out of Asia, coming along the north side here of, of Sumatra. They would come across, stop here in Sri Lanka at Colombo. Some would head up into the Persian Gulf, but most of them would head through the uh, Gulf of Aden, the Bab el Mandeb, the Red Sea, into the Mediterranean, and then stop at a series of these large terminals. And they would go to a series of ports. And what these ships became were economy of scale massive. You're talking about 24,000 boxes, but with very small crews, literally the same size crew you have on a small container ship, you have on a big container ship. And what you got was efficiency. You got massive efficiency. And by dropping them off along this entire route through the Med up to Europe, and then back out again, sweeping up containers and boxes, come back the other way, sweep through a series of ports, Singapore, Hong Kong, over to Taiwan, up through Korea to China. That is efficient, but now what you have is this diversion. 
And this diversion is causing a lot of problems because these big massive container ships are all coming in around this 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 point now. Normally they would have gone through the Med, but now they got to divert in, swing into Tangier or Algeciras, head into the Mediterranean, and then head up here to Northern Europe. What they would love to be able to do is come around the southern tip of South Africa here and head straight to the East Coast and the Gulf Coast. But the problem is New York, Savannah, Houston, they're not dredged for it. Now, they've just recently been dredged to accommodate the new Neo Panamax vessels. But what companies like Mediterranean Shipping and Maersk and HMM and Hop Hog and Costco and Evergreen and all these shipping companies that are owned overseas would love the United States to do is invest more in their ports, dredge them, raise bridges. For example, in New York, they had to raise, raise the Bayonne Bridge to allow the, the Neo Panamax vessels to get underneath the Bayonne Bridge to get into Newark. They would love for the United States to invest in their harbors so that you can bring these big monsters in. Now, it would make sense, but you can't just do it in one port. You don't want to bring in a 24,000 box ship into one port because it blows the schedule out. You'll be working that ship for a week and you'll be dumping so many containers you're not getting other ships in. So you would have to develop not one port, but multiple ports on the East Coast and on the Gulf Coast. And if you decide to go across the Pacific here, take one of these ships and go into LA or Long Beach, which are the two big ports, that's the same problem. You're going in and dumping just into one port. You can't run down to the Panama Canal, for example, and go through, you're too big. There's not a lane big enough down there. So these ships, these massive ultra large container ships are really committed on this route. So, you know, when you have ships of this size, you need a massive commitment in there to be able to handle them. You need the port facilities. You need the road, the rail coming in, because what happens is they tend to throw off. It, it, it's very similar in, in the fire service. We do something where we do what's called a water shuttle, where you kind of dump water and you feed other trucks. And the problem is when you have a big, huge, massive tanker that's bigger than everything else, it throws everything off. And as you see here, these ship to shore cranes have to be tall enough and long enough to reach those outboard containers. Because if you don't, then you have a massive problem. And when you look at ships like Everlot, which are just behemoths, you need a lot of support to make these work. A lot of containers coming in, that's a lot to process. And these companies all would love for the United States to invest because it would shift these large container ships off just this predominantly Europe-Asia route and get them servicing into the United States. And you're kind of hearing that now from the companies. You're really hearing that. But the point is, this should be a shared burden. It shouldn't be just on the ports and the federal government to do this. This is a benefit for the container ships, too. They would get a much more efficient movement of goods. But what they tend to do is really push this onto the terminals, onto the ports, and onto the, the state, local, and federal governments to do the dredging, to do all the maintenance, to ensure that there's proper equipment in place, to get the new cranes. And what the companies want to do is sail in and do it. Now, granted, you're going to get more efficient cargo coming in. You're going to get lower fuel costs. But again, the profit is going to the, the companies that are hauling the goods. Uh, the question is, when does too big get too big? Because if you start going around Africa, if the limitation is no longer the Suez Canal, then you could potentially see ships bigger than what's currently out there. They may be bigger than 400 meters or almost 1,300 feet long because now you don't have that restriction in the Suez. They may be able to carry not 24,000 boxes, but maybe 30,000 boxes. And in truth, the limitation you have at that point becomes the Straits of Malacca of all things, the strait going from Singapore out into the Indian Ocean. And so you have a lot of questions being raised that the Houthis are raising about the future. Now, none of this happens anytime soon. Nothing that's being done right now can change the way that trade pattern is set up. However, companies are going to start looking for, hey, because of what happened with the Houthi and the diversion out of the Suez Canal, we need to start talking about more efficient supply chains. And what we really need to do is talk about building up the ships. 
I tend to think the ships are about the size you need them. I don't think you want to get much bigger than they're at, but we should be talking about making the ports more efficient and improving throughput through the ports. One of the big dogs for the American ports is that you know we can move a, con a container on and off the ship as fast as anybody. That's not the issue. The issue is processing, processing the containers in the terminals. That's where we need the efficiency, and that's where we should be looking at the infrastructure. We don't need to be investing in further dredging and building bigger ports and consolidating the ports. We have lots of ports. Our ports are big. We're handling the containers we have going in. The problem is getting the containers out of the ports into the infrastructure, into the transportation system. That's where I'd argue where we need to see it. Uh, unless you have a series of ports to do this to, it doesn't work. You can't just go into one or two ports with these monsters. You need a series of ports. You see that in Europe, see it along the uh, Middle East and the African coast. You need multiple ports to go into. You don't want this just going into LA or Long Beach or New York or Savannah. You need at least half a dozen ports to, for this to go in to be efficient. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You can give it a big thumbs up, number one. You can hit the super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next episode, this is Al, signing off.